Hi guys, today we're going to be playing Love at the Milky Way Diner. This is a demo, it's not the full game. The full game is a Kickstarter project at the moment. It's not um, out yet. So we're going to be trying out the demo, seeing what happens. I'll leave info to the Kickstarter project below. I think they still have like a month left of um, funding. So if you want to check it out, you can. I know I will be, because basically the premise is it's a dating sim set in a diner in outer space. Does that not sound great? Does that not sound amazing? <laughs> so, let's check it out and let's see what happens. Okay, so let's get started. I'm loving the logo too, that's cute. Let's begin. Draw it. Hi, traveller. What, what is, is your name? name? Ooh. Evie? Ooh, last name too. Okay, let's do Sweetly. Your name is Evie Sweetly, correct? Yup. Thank you. Enjoy your journey. I rub my eyes. I'm still feeling groggy and stiff from my time in the transport ship status pods. I stare out of the ship's many windows and into the emptiness of deep space. I'm sitting in the observation lounge of Argo 24. Your best choice for inter-system travel leaving the Helios system, with prices that won't break the bank. There are far more glamorous methods of space travel. Five-star cruising ships with luxurious rooms and great meals, where you can spend the long trip between star systems in leisure and comfort. But comfort costs credits, and I'm pretty short on those. So it's budget travel and budget stasis pods for me. And the Argo space fleet is known for being especially no frills. The ship dips and my destination comes into view. The deep space station Hesperides, my new home. It's a sleek Aurelian design with habitat and docking rings orbiting around the station's main superstructure. Spacecraft zip in and out and around the station like bees circling a hive. Unfamiliar alien designs in unexpected shapes. Thankfully, I was able to utilize an onboard sonic shower and freshen up before making my way here. My stomach rumbles and I pull out the complimentary juice box and small biscuits that were left by my pod for me to find when I woke up. I tear open the package and nibble on the slightly sweet and crumbly digestive. The biscuit is plain and the strawberry juice box is warm, but it's my body's first solid food in two weeks, and it's a relief to my empty stomach. I watch as one of the smaller ships heads towards a spot in space marked by blinking buoys. Or boys. I'm not sure how to say that word. <laughs> There's a flash as the ship speeds past them and into the wormhole, disappearing from sight. There are four other spots like this in the area, in the area around the Hesperides. Stable wormholes, each leading to a different place light years away from here. Attention all passengers, we are now beginning docking procedures for Deep Space Station Hesperides. Please make sure to bring all your belongings with you as you disembark. On behalf of the captain and all of our crew, we thank you for choosing Argo Space Transport. Ooh. I disembark from the Argo 20 into a massive arrivals hangar. I'm immediately met with the shift in Artigrav. The difference between the calibration of the transport ship and the station is slight, but there's just a bit more bounce. All around me are ships of all shapes and sizes from across the galaxy, from larger passenger cruisers and cargo freighters to smaller personal crafts and aliens. I've never seen so many different species all in one place. Hustling between ships, trying to make connections, lining up to collect their bags and moving cargo around. A dizzying flurry of fur and scales and tentacles and tails. It's so much to take in. The Helio system doesn't really get that much into stellar tourism, so seeing other species is a rarity. But this is the Hesperides space station, gateway to the Theta sector and the fringe colonies therein. In this part of the galaxy, humans are the minority. Attention, this is the final boarding call for flight XJ6B6 with service to Kashroth 4. All passengers should now be on board at gate C32. Out of the way! 
A voice from behind me calls, and before I can react, I'm shoved hard to one side. I'm thrown off balance by the impact, and I tumble forward, hitting the ground hard. My travel bag slides a few feet away from me on the metal floor. I look up just in time to see a Sketrian with a large backpack run and shove their way through the crowd. Hey, watch where you're going, growls another voice as I hear footfalls jog towards me. The owner of the voice stops in front of me and crouches down to meet my eyes. Ooh, hey, are you okay? She says with concern in her deep voice. She's an alien, a Kaitri. She has a worried look in her golden eyes. Pulling up next to her is our hover cart, piled high with boxes. You're not hurt, are you? I'm okay. I might have a bruise or two, though. I say sheepishly as I rub my right elbow, which bore the brunt of the impact. Here, let me help you stand. She extends her large, clawed hand towards me, and I take it. She pulls me up with ease. I can't help but be slightly startled by her strength. Ooh la la. <laughs> Thanks, I, um, I say and crane my neck to look behind her, trying to spot my errant bags. Following my gaze, she turns around. Oh, don't mention it, she says brightly as she reaches down and grabs my two bags, throwing them both over one of her shoulders with ease. I'm Kael, by the way. She flashes me a toothy smile, her teeth, her fangs. I'd seen Kaitri in vids before, or from a distance a couple times on Mars. But this is my first time really meeting a member of their species up close like this. Oh, she's kind of cool or she's kind of beautiful. Ah, let's go with beautiful, why not? Why not? <laughs> she's kind of beautiful, I catch myself thinking. Beautiful and strong. She's giving Carlite vibes. There is something about her that isn't totally unlike the lionesses I've seen in vids of old earthen species. Kael moves in the same powerful, confident and graceful way they did. Her ears are decorated with gold and sparkling gems. They clink softly as her ears move, trying to catch different sounds in the hangar. She has eyes that shine as brightly as the jewellery that adorns her. They are warm and kind and the colour of liquid amber. Not to mention her bright blue hair. It looks so soft and fluffy. And to top it off, she's friendly and kind. Rushing over to make sure a random stranger, an alien like me, was okay. What's wrong? Cachette got your tongue? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just spaced out, that's all. Flushed slightly. Did she notice me staring? I hope not. I'm Evie. Well, Evie, let's get you to where you gotta go. Do you have a connection to catch? Oh, oh, no, 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 no connection. This is me. I'm actually moving on to the station. Really? Well, in that case, I'll bring you to arrivals. I'm headed there myself. Follow me. She smiles an easy smile and nudges the parked hover cart next to her tail. It whirs to life and follows her as she starts to walk, my bag still slung over her shoulder. Clearly she has no intention of letting me carry them myself, and I don't want to. <laughs> I decide I'm just going to roll with it for now. I still feel pretty rough from my time in stasis. I'm not about to protest. I dust myself off and start to follow her through the crowd. So, Evie, you're moving in on the Hesperides? What brings you to this side of the galaxy? If you don't mind me asking that. We get a lot of folks passing through, as you might have noticed. But it's not every day someone decides to make an extended stay here. I guess you could say... Ooh, I'm looking for a fresh start. I'm taking over my late aunt's diner. The Milky Way diner? Oh, yeah, how did you know? The Milky Way diner is a Hurstbury station staple. I heard it was closing after your aunt passed. It's good to hear someone's keeping that place up and running. It's an important spot for the community here. And when you're this far away from home, community is everything. Oh, that's a lot to live up to. I had no idea it was so popular. You and your aunt weren't close? Then quickly, as if catching herself, she says, Sorry, I didn't mean to pry. You don't have to share if you don't want to. No, it's okay. We... Weren't, not really anyways. 
I only met her a couple of times in my life when she came to visit my family in the Helios system. She had her own thing going on here. Her life out in deep space, the diner. My parents never really had the creds to take us out of the system to visit. Then about a month ago, we got word she'd had a stroke and passed away. When we got the will, they said that she would like one of her family members to take over if possible. She didn't have any kids of her own, so um, here I am. So you just dropped everything to come out here? That's pretty bold for someone who's never left their home star system. I'm impressed. Not much to drop when the company you've been working for goes bankrupt and you're out of a job. Fresh start sounded pretty good after that. It's true. No job, no love life. My friends from college and I had drifted apart. Sure, my family was there, but they all had their own stuff going on. There really wasn't much of anything holding me back. Buying a one-way discount ticket to the gateway to the theatre section, to the theatre sector, sorry, and running a diner with no experience seemed like a much better option than just continuing to aimlessly drift around home. I get that. Sometimes change is good. Kayle reaches over and gives me a gentle and reassuring pat on the back. You've got this. I'm sure the Milky Way diner is in good hands. There's a warm and reassuring look in her eyes. She's so easy to talk to. I'm thankful to have met someone as kind as Kayle as soon as I arrived. What about you? You said we get a lot of folks passing through here. So I guess it's safe to assume you live on the station too? I'm a cargo runner, so I'd sooner say I live on my ship rather than here. The Hesperides is kind of like a home base for me, though. Got a good steady list of clients here, not too far off a trip to run on, and the people here are nice. What kind of cargo do you run? That depends. On? Kale's amber eyes narrow and her ears twitch slightly. You're not a Gabby agent, are you? Kale said with a conspiratorial edge to her voice. The Galactic Alliance Bureau of Investigation. No? There's an obvious uneasy tone in my voice. I'm just messing with you, she says with a laugh. I transport the usual stuff. Tech, food, alcohol, medicine, but fun stuff like that. I do supply runs for a couple of the on-station merchants. You could place an order with me. If you needed some ingredients, they can't grow on the agricultural deck. I have a great whisker fish supplier back on run on. Also, she leans in a bit closer and says just a bit quieter. I have connections in just about every sector of the galaxy. Whatever it is you need, I can find it. For the right price, of course. Or the right person. Kale says with a wink and an undeniably flirty tone in her voice. Am I being hit on by a cage tree right now? KL isn't exactly being subtle. I'm not necessarily surprised she'd be interested in a member of a different sapient species. After all, interspace species coupling aren't unheard of. People from different star systems have been living side by side for centuries. There was even a Martian drama series a few years back about a narrow and a human. I am surprised she's interested in me, though. Ooh, go on then, you've got to. Oh? And how would someone like me, for example, go about becoming the right person? Well, you can start by letting me buy you a drink. And maybe, who knows, I might just decide I like you. Decide you like me? So you haven't decided yet? Oof, I'm hurt. I say with mock offence, putting my hand over my heart. Kael lets out a chuckle. Maybe I just want to make sure I was right to have a good feeling about you. Then I'll have to take you up on that offer, won't I? Maybe I'll even cook you something on the house to really win you over. Can Kitri eat pancakes? I feel like pancakes are good kind of food. And easy to make, I think to myself. We can. I've had them before. And enjoyed them. I like sweet things. No wonder you had a good feeling about me then. Kale's ears prick up a bit in surprise. For a moment, I think I might have caught her off guard, but she quickly recovers with a devilish smile. Because you're sweet? You said it, not me. Kale chuckles and leans down slightly so she's closer to my ear when she says, You got me there, sugar. Kale literally 
hers when she says the word sugar. I feel a tingle run up my spine and my face flush deeply. Oh my god. <laughs> She's good, I think to myself. She leans away from me with a knowing smile. I'll give you a chance to get your space legs before I rush you to the nearest bar. I'll be in port for a couple more days. I'll catch you once you're settled. We stop walking, getting into the short line leading to a kiosk manned by a human in a green uniform. Right, here we are, she says, putting down my bags. Give me your palm pad. I'll have my contact info. That way you can place an order with me if you need anything for the diner. And let me know when you're free for that drink, of course. If we're in the same system, we can chat in real time. Otherwise, you can shoot me a text or a voice message, and I'll get back to you once it reaches me. I know how interstellar communications work, you know. I say with a laugh, handing her my palm pad. This might be my first time out of the system, but I'm not totally clueless. I know. It's just a reminder. She says as she types in her contact details. She has my palm pad back to me. I notice we've made it to the front of the line now. I've got to get all this stuff where it needs to go, so I'll head in first. I'll be seeing you around. See you around, KL. She puts her large hand on my shoulder as she passes by me and walks up to the kiosk, her hover car following behind her. Officer Shibu Morency, what's the head of security doing checking arrivals? From where I stand now, I can get a better look at the human man behind the kiosk. Officer Shibu, as KL had called him. He has wavy chocolate brown hair that curls around the nape of his neck and a stern expression on his face. He's not too tall with an athlete's build. Is it? Uh, can you hear the dog barking in the back? I can't help but notice the prominent bags under his eyes. He looks like he hasn't had a good night's sleep in ages. Officer Eshket called in sick today, so I'm taking over his duties for now. Can I please get your name and purpose for your visit to the station? His voice is deep and soft, with a stern edge and a slight fringed planet accent. Really, she woo We've got to do this whole song and dance every time. It's not like you don't know my name. I'm call sign by now. I know your name, KL, but regulations are regulations, and there are quite and there <laughs> and there are questions I need to ask every person who goes through arrivals. Now, can I please get your name and purpose for your visit to the Hearst Breedy Station? KL's tail twitches slightly in irritation, and she rolls her eyes. K.L. Voshruna, Cargo Delivery 4, Ashketh's General, Haley Roswell, and Wayfarer's Rest. Shipping Manifest will be under the call sign Starblazer. She types away quickly at the hollow screen in front of him, giving the manifest a quick read. Thank you. Looks like everything's in order. He looks up from the screen and at K.L. Also, this is your reminder that all weapons are left on the ship. She flips open the flaps of her holsters with a flourish, revealing the empty pockets. I know, I know, it's not like this is my first time here. I'm only reminding you because you forgot last time. Because I was in a hurry. I had a row that needed to get back into temperature control. It was losing freshness by the seconds. They're going back and forth like this, but KL doesn't sound angry. Just mildly annoyed at the bureaucracy of it all. Gael seems to be the type that chafes up against rules and regulations, and Shibu doesn't seem the type to loosen protocol for anyone. Arms out, just going to give you a quick scan and then you're free to go. A pair of spherical float droids deploy from behind the kiosk and float on either side of Kael and her hover cart. Scan, please hold still. The two droids emit green scanning beams and float around Kael, scanning her and her cargo. By the way, you look more exhausted than usual today. Are you holding up all right? Now it was Shibu's turn to roll his eyes. He sighs a bit and rubs the back of his neck. I appreciate your continued concern about my well-being, but I'm, I'm really fine. It's nothing new. Still, you should check in with Saria. I did a couple days ago, but like I said, I'm fine. Shibu's face softens as he speaks. The droids finish their scan and the green light turns off. No forbidden articles or pathogens detected. Kale Voshruna, you are free to proceed into the station. Please enjoy your stay. 
Okay, okay. I brought you some new herbal tea from Ranon. I'll leave it for you in your mail locker. Thanks, Kale. I'll be sure to try it before bed tonight. You better. And let me know how it goes. I'll catch you later, bud. With that, Kale gives her car a nudge and she walks into the station, but not before looking over her shoulder at me and giving me a smile and a wave. See ya, sugar. And with that, she disappears around the corner. I grab my bags and lug them over to the kiosk where Shiwu stands. Welcome to the Hasbridis. Can I please get your name and purpose for your visit to the station? Shiwu says, meeting my eyes over his hollow screen. Evie Sweetly, I'm moving on to the Hasbridis to take over the management of the Milky Way Diner. Shiwu raises his thick eyebrows and the corners of his mouth lift slightly into a small smile. Ah, yes. We've been expecting you. Welcome aboard. I'm Officer Shiwu Morunsi, Head of Security. Can I please get you to confirm that these details are correct? I'll also need your travel documents. He hands me the hollow screen. Let me see. Ooh. Oh, okay, I can just change my pronouns. She, her. And then how do I leave? This little button? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I scan my wrist chip on the hollow screen before handing it back to Shiwu, who gives it a quick once over. All right, everything looks good. This is a GA Category 3 station, so all Class 4 and above weapons are strictly prohibited on the Hesperides. If you are carrying any energy blasters, phasers, electropulse emitters, or laser swords, please leave them with me. We will store them in a secure location till such time as you leave the station. Ooh. Good thing I don't carry weapons. Why would I need a weapon? Good thing I don't carry any weapons, then. Can't say I have any need for them. Oh my god. <laughs> She smiles a bit at that. I wish more people shared that sentiment. Do a lot of sapiens try to bring weapons on board? I ask a bit worried. I'd heard stories on the news of the lawlessness of certain parts of the galaxy where the GA had less control. Stories about pirates and bounty hunters armed to the teeth. That sounds pretty cool. Was this station the galactic equivalent of a frontier town like in the old Earth Western movies? We're not too far from some fringe colonies. Things are a lot rougher out there. But personally, I've always felt that carrying a weapon invites more trouble than it solves. He looks up from the screen to meet my eyes. I must look worried because he quickly clarifies. You don't have anything to worry about. The station is completely safe. The Hearst Breedies is under GA protection and we take our no weapons policy very seriously. You won't be seeing any shootouts on the promenade. Anyway, let's see. I'll go ahead and update your access file so you can use your wrist chip to access the Milky Way Diner as well as your quarters. If you'd like, I can have someone from the agricultural deck drop some ingredients off at the diner for you. Oh, yeah, that would be great. I'd like to take the kitchen for a spin. I figured as much. Let's see, what else? You'll be in room three of living block B. Your room will have a bathroom with water and sonic showers, a tub, a kitchenette, as well as your bed. Sheets and pillows are provided and the room has been prepped for your arrival. There is also a common space with a living area and larger kitchen. Your neighbours have already been told to expect you. Please make sure to introduce yourself when you get the chance as you'll be sharing the space with them. I heard about a similar setups in other stations and space colonies. Life in space can be isolating, so dwellings and neighbourhoods are often planned with an emphasis on community building. Noted. Oh, do you know my neighbours? Do you like living here? Do you like living here? I've never lived off-world, so I'm not super familiar with station life. I do, and I'm sure you will too. Sharing space with your neighbours and living alongside different species can take some getting used to, if you're not accustomed to it. But you'll get settled soon, so try not to worry about it too much. That's reassuring to hear. This is also new to me. It's not the biggest station, functionally. It's kind of like living in a small town. There's good and the bad that comes with that. For example, once news got out that the Milky Way Diner wasn't actually closing down and Cassie's family member was coming from Helios to take it over, let's just say you've been the talk of the town. Oh, small town gossip is a thing even at the gateway to the theatre sector, huh? I'm sorry to say. She says with a shrug of his massive shoulders. On the bright side, you're the human that's bringing back a beloved station eatery. 
so I'm sure you'll receive a warm welcome as a result. KL mentioned the diner was pretty popular. I, whoa. I'm hit with a sudden wave of vertigo. It's like the ground under my feet has given away. <laughs> I feel my eyes roll into the back of my head and I crumple. I'm fully expecting to hit the ground for the second time in less than an hour. But the impact doesn't come. Oh, I've been caught. He's caught me. That was close. I hear Shiwa's voice, closer and softer now than it was before. My eyes flutter open and I realise why I'm not currently concussed. He caught me. Shiwa's face is only a handful of inches away from mine. This close up, I'm struck by just how handsome he is. His hair falls into his eyes and his thick brows are knitted in concern. A slight frown on his soft looking lips. One of his hands supports the head, the other is wrapped around the small of my back. He must have vaulted over the kiosk and caught me just before I hit the ground. Um, well, I've just fainted, so I'm gonna chill. I'm gonna stay put. My head is spinning, my eyes going in and out of focus. I don't dare try and stand on my own. Easy there. Looks like there are still some sedatives in your syst- sedatives in your system from the stasis pods. Shibu says gently. We look into each other's eyes for a few moments. I find myself increasingly aware of the feeling of his hands under my back and head, supporting my weight with ease. Is it just me, or do the dark circles under his eyes somehow make him even more handsome, I think to myself. I notice a dusting of pink start to cover his cheeks as he averts his eyes from mine. Do you think you can stand? I come back to reality, suddenly finding myself a bit self-conscious. Oh, oh, yeah, I think so. I, yeah, thank you for catching me. All part of the job. She helps me stand, supporting me as I try putting weight on my wobbly legs. Thankfully, I feel the vertigo waning. Oh, I feel awful, I say as he lets me stand on my own once again. I get my bearings and he walks back to his post behind the security kiosk. If it's any constellation, you're not the first per- Constellation? <laughs> Consolation, you're not the first person to faint from cheap stasis sedatives. Still, you should head straight away to the med bay once you've been scanned and cleared. Dr. Soraya will take a look at you, and she can give you something to help you as the drugs leave your system. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I'll do that. All right, arms out, Shiwu says as the two float droids deploy. I comply and they take a couple moments to complete their scan. No forbidden articles or pathogens detected. Absolutely, you are free to proceed into the station. Please enjoy your stay. I start to pick up my heavy bags. You can just leave those here. I'll get a delivery bot to take your bags to your room. Just focus on getting to the med bay. It's on level 5. He types a series of commands into his screen and a rectangular bot comes speeding around the corner and skids to a stop in front of me. With a series of cheerful sounding beeps, it splits from the vertical seam down its middle, a compartment filling the gap between its two halves. As I place my bags into the compartment, I notice a small velvet cylinder perched on top of the front half of the robot. Is it wearing a bellhop hat? Beep boop, boop beep, chirps the bot. I know better than to anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize simple AIs like this but I can't help but think it sounds happy. That's certainly not regulation. I'll have to talk to Roswell about this, she mutters under his breath. Now loaded with its cargo, the delivery bot closes the compartment and it speeds away as fast as it came. Oh, thanks, Shiwu. I guess I'll see you around? Shiwu gives me a full, bright smile. See you around, Evie. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. I say, returning a smile and waving over my shoulder as I head into the station proper. From behind me, I can hear Shiwu call up the next person in line and start his spiel all over again once more. A light chime goes off as I enter the med bay. I'll be with you in just a moment, calls out a calm, feminine voice. Just take a seat in the waiting area. Ooh, cute. The office is small, with a dividing wall separating the treatment and waiting areas. 
As I take a seat, I sneak a peek into the treatment area. There is an examination table as well as an open med pod where a short Arunlian woman is in a hospital gown. A Naru in a doctor's coat faces her, looking at the notepad o- looking at the notes on her hollow pad. <laughs> the same voice from before, the one belonging to the doctor continues. As I was saying, thankfully your time in the med pod has healed up your skin from the burns you suffered, and all damage to your eye was thankfully reversible. I'd still advise limiting exposure to unnecessary visual strain for a few days, limit screen time and get lots of rest. However, Vega, I'm afraid you'll have some permanent discoloration on your skin. I doubt this is what you wanted to hear. Sadly, Arulian skin is particularly prone to scarring, especially after a trauma like the one you faced. There is, of course, a possibility it will continue to fade as time goes on, and if you'd like, I could put you in contact with a cosmetic dermatology specialist on Sios. He's an old colleague of mine and is very skilled with reconstructive procedures on a Rulian skin. The patient sitting on the med pod, Vega, speaks up. Her voice is sweet and carries the almost melodic sounding Arulian accent. Thank you so much for your treatment, Dr. Soraya. That's okay, really. I don't mind the scarring too much. I'm just happy I'm safe. You are incredibly fortunate that Officer Shibu was able to get you when he did. From what he told me, that rusty old ship you flew in on was a death trap. You're lucky only the tertiary fuel line burst. If it had been the secondary, or stars forbid the primary, there may not have been anything left of you to put in the med pod. Now, here are your clothes. You can go ahead and get changed in the washroom over there. I'm going to take a look at my next patient. Thank you, Vega says. She hops off the med pod and walks over to the bathroom, closing the door behind her. All right, you can come on over and take a seat on the examination table here. I follow the doctor's instructions, walking over to the exam table and taking a seat. Hello, I am Dr. Soraya. How can I help you today? Hi, I'm Evie. I just got off a long haul trip. I've been out of stasis for about two hours, but I've been feeling kind of off. A bit sore and dizzy. I have a headache and I, I kind of fainted earlier. I see. That's not good at all. Soraya says, typing notes into her hollow pad. How long did you spend in stasis? Did you fly in on a personal or mass transit craft? Mass transit, one of the Argo spaceline ships? Soraya winces and clicks her tongue in disapproval. That makes sense. The brand of sedatives used for stasis in the Argo space fleet are outlawed in narrow space for this exact reason. I'm sorry you're feeling unwell as a result. She gives me a sympathetic look and types a few final notes into her hollow pad before placing it on the table next to her. Lie back on the examination table. I'm going to do a quick scan to check our vitals. I do a Soraya instructs and lie down. She grabs the scanner and leans over me, and as she does, one of the tentacles on her head falls in front of her face. She gently pushes it behind her pointed ear. I can see the chromatic... of chromatophores in her skin at the tips of her tentacles shifting. Different shades of mostly coral pink, but looking closer I can see undertones of blue and green. I know that Naru have chromatophores change colours with their emotions, but I haven't learned what each colour means. Soraya hovers the scanner over me and I do my best to stay still. After a few moments, it's over. Alright Evie, you can sit back up now. It seems like your body is still attempting to break down and process the last of the, the last of the sedatives in your system. That's why you're feeling the lingering effects we call pod sickness. Soraya explains as I return to my sitting position. I can give you an injection that will speed up the process significantly. Since it will be going into your bloodstream directly, you will feel much better quicker. Are you okay with needles? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Needles don't really bother me all that much. That's good to hear. Sit tight while I get everything prepped then. Soraya goes to the cabinet in the treatment area and scans her wrist chip. I watch as she preps the needle, filling it with medicine from a vial. She places it on a tray next to some gauze and some sanitizing fluid. She brings the tray back over and places it in the little rolling table by the examination table. 
All right, Evie, I'm going to just do a quick swab here to sanitize the area. She takes my forearm in her hand. I feel a slight brush of her skin on mine. I don't know why, but I half expected her skin to feel slimy like a squid. But it's not at all. Her touch is cool, yes, but incredibly smooth. My eyes meet her strange alien ones as she finishes. Are you ready? She asks, looking at me with a calm, pleasant expression. I can't help but feel a slight flush creep over my cheeks as she says those words. I can kick myself mentally because there's nothing flirty happening here whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. Alright, Evie, can you breathe in for me? And now, out. As I exhale, Soraya swiftly administers the shot, then covers the small puncture with a little med patch shaped like a little yellow star. There we go, all done. You can lie back for a moment while the medicine does its work. I'm going to clean this up. I lie back down on the table as Soraya sets about putting her supplies away. So, you're Cassie's relative that's taking over the Milky Way diner, right? Yeah, Officer Shibu mentioned people on the station have been waiting for me to get here. We have. Welcome to the Hesperides. How are you feeling now? Would you like to stand up? I get up off the examination table. The difference is startling. My headache and dizziness are gone. I feel much better now, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Are you going to be heading to the diner now? Well, yeah, I'm starving. Officer Shibu said he was going to ask someone from the agricultural deck to come by with some produce. I better head over there if I want to meet them. Sounds like a great plan. Maybe you could come by the diner sometime. I think I'll probably be open in a couple days. I was planning on it. It will be nice not to have to cook for every meal again. As I get myself ready to leave, Vega comes out of the bathroom. Alright, I'm off. Thank you so much for everything, Dr. Soraya. It was my pleasure, Vega. Please feel free to come back if you need anything else. If you have the time before you head to your room, would you consider stopping by the tech office? Our station's lead technical and mechanic, Roswell, has been looking at your ship. They'll want to talk to you when you get the chance. Maybe you can walk with Evie here to the promenade. You'll need to pass through it to reach the tech office. And it will be good for you to get a lay of the land or so to speak. Soraya turns to meet my eyes. Would that be okay with you, Evie? I think it would be good if you stuck together. Less likely for one of you to get lost. Yeah, well, sure, I don't mind. Fantastic. You both remember what I said. Try not to push yourselves too much, okay? And please come back next time if you need medical assistance. You've got it, Dr. Soraya. Thank you again for all your help. I walk over to Vega, and she gives me a polite bow and greeting. I return the gesture. Hi, I'm Vega, she says, raising her hand in a small wave. I'm Evie. Let's go. I turn and nod my head to Soraya as we leave the med bay. Bye. Soraya smiles and waves us goodbye. So how are you holding up? Sorry, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but from what I heard, it sounded like you had a rough couple of days. Yeah, um, my starship had a malfunction while exiting the stable wormhole. Unstable tertiary fuel line. I thought I could handle it on my own, so I tried to fix it myself, but... She gestures to the discoloured side of her face. I might have overestimated my own abilities. Thankfully, I was able to get a distress call out before something really bad happened. That must have been terrifying. Oh, it was. I really thought this is going to be it for me. Thankfully, Officer Shiwu and the rest of the rescue team were able to get to me super fast. I'm holding up pretty well, all things considered. Just a bit stiff. I'm glad to be up and walking, though. I know the feeling. I just got out of a two-week stasis early this morning. It feels so good to stretch my legs. I've heard those long-haul stasis pods are super awful. Is that why you were in the med bay? Pod sickness? Yeah, they, they really are. I'm much better than that. I fainted earlier, though. Thankfully, Shuru was there to catch me, I think to myself. As we walk through the hallways, I notice Vega staring intently at me. Is... is there something on my face? I ask, and we stop walking for a moment. Oh, no! Sorry, I didn't mean to stare and make you uncomfy. It's just, I've never met a human in person before. Well... Technically, I met Officer Shiwu, but only briefly, and I was a bit busy trying to not, like, die. Well, you're the first Arulian I've ever met, so I guess we're even. It's my first time out of my home system. Oh, my stars, me too! She says enthusiastically. 
I've met Naru and Sketchians and even a Kai a Kai tree before, but never a human. That's not all that unsurprising, I think to myself. Travel visas to the Rulian home system are notoriously hard to get a hold of, especially for humans. Vega leans in closer, staring intently at me with her shining red eyes. Up close like this, I notice a slight shimmer to her green skin, almost like she's wearing a light dusting of body glitter. Arunians as a species look like mythical creatures to us humans, like the fae or elves of old earth legends come true. Their entire race was stupidly, stunningly beautiful by almost all human measures of conventional attractiveness. So, what's your impression of seeing one of us in person? I ask, trying to mask my self-consciousness from being looked at so intensely. Your ears are kind of funny. They're round. Thanks. Ooh, do you want to touch them? Do they all sparkle? Go on, I'll let her touch them. Why not? <laughs> do you want a cup of feel? Do you want to see? Vega's eyes brighten. Can I really? I nod and lean towards her. Vega lets out a little squeal of excitement. Gently, she rubs the tip of her small green index finger along the outer helix of my ear. Does it tickle? Everyone ears are really sensitive. Vega asks, a slight teal blush dusting her soft cheeks. Maybe just a little, but I'm, I'm okay. I pull away, standing back up straight. Vega continues to examine my face. Some Arunians say humans are pretty ugly. But I don't agree with that at all. She muses matter-of-factly. I raise my eyebrow at her comment. I'm glad you don't agree, but I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a little insulting. And even a bit speciesist. It's one thing for species to have a different beauty standard, but to say it just like that. Well, oh, oh, I think that's supposed to be her talking. Well, what do humans say about us? How to answer that question? It's a bit of a weird quirk of evolution that Arunians and humans happen to look a lot alike, but the histories of our civilizations could not be more different. Arunians were the first GA civilization to harness nuclear fission as an energy, as an energy source. Incredibly technologically advanced and ridiculously wealthy, thanks to their resource-rich home planet of Arulia Prime and four habitable moons. Humans, on the other hand, are best known for being the only species in the galactic assembly that somehow managed to fuck their home world till it was no longer habitable through their own greed and stupidity. Sure, we managed to survive off the collapse of our home planet and expand through our own solar system with the comparatively rudimentary technology we had developed but we probably could have never dreamed of achieving interstellar travel on our own. It's doubtful that GA would have ever reached out and made first contact with the primitive, resource-poor residents of the Helios system had their hand not been forced. It was an open secret that the Aurelians tended to look down on our species more than any other. And the general human consensus? Aurelians are a bunch of beautiful, rich snobs, blessed with ridiculous good looks and more resources than they know what to do with. Oh, I want to, no, she's nice. I want to be nice to her. I'm not going to call her a snob. That your species is very beautiful and a bit full of yourselves, I think to myself. Thank you, she says, flipping her hair over her shoulder and flashing me a dazzlingly bright smile before continuing to walk. Yep, definitely full of yourselves. I follow her down the hall. Where were you heading before your ship broke down? I wanted to get as far away from the Aurelian system as possible, so I figured the Theta Sector was a good bet. That makes sense, Aurelian moons are all the way on the other side of the galaxy, even with the help of stable wormholes. It still would have been a three or four week journey to get here. You're not a criminal or something, are you? On the run from the law, headed to a fringe colony to lie low and plot your next big heist? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing like that. I just felt so trapped back at home, I guess you could say. I needed some space. Ugh, was that supposed to be a pun? You didn't like it? I thought it was out of this world. What about you? Why are you here? Vega asks. You're looking at the new owner and chef at the Milky Way Diner. I know, I know. I say with a proud smile. Oh wow, you're a chef? Do you serve human food? I've always wondered what you guys eat. 
I plan on it, but I'd also like to learn some recipes from other cultures. You should come by if you're still on the station when I open in a couple days. Oh yes, please, I can't wait! By now we'd reached the promenade and I could see the outside of the Milky Way diner. It was a shop front, like any other on the promenade, but there was a window on the side with the diner's name painted on it in a bluish green letters, which made it unmistakable. Speaking of the diner, this is me. Do you think you'll be able to make it to the tech office on your own from here? Yeah, I think I'll manage. Thanks for walking with me, Evie. Do you think I could maybe get your contact info on my palm pad? Then a bit more shyly, she adds, Just uh, so you can let me know when you're open your diner. I promise not to bug you. Oh, yeah, sure. She hands me her palm pad and I type in my name and contact info and then add, First human friend. She takes her palm pad back and beams as she looks at the contact profile. You're really my friend now? She asks, hugging her palm pad, palm pad to her chest. Yeah, I think so. Is that weird to say? Vega shakes her head. I wonder if I imagine the tears I saw welling up in her eyes. No, no, not at all. I'll send you a message. Make sure to log me in as your first Arulian friend too. She turns away from me and begins to walk off. Bye, see you soon. Vega shoots me one last smile, and with that, she very nearly jogs away from me and around the corner towards the tech office. Ooh, we're inside. I scan my wrist chip and the door to the diner unlocks. There's a slight chime as I open the door. The diner is small and cosy, with a couple booths and some countertop seating. The kitchen is open, and there's a door leading to the walk-in and an office at the back. I walk behind the counter and explore the kitchen. Pots, pans, knives and cutting boards all clean and in their place. There's a few non-perishable ingredients still on the shelves, but it seems like the walk-in was cleaned out. Sanitation probably did that so nothing would start going bad. I ran my hand across the well-used countertop and let my mind wander. The sound of the door chime jolts me back into reality. I turn around to see an Arulian man in an orange worksuit standing in the doorway. He carries a large crate under his muscular arm. Um, excuse me, are you Evie? Officer Shibu asked me to bring some fresh produce from that ag deck around. His voice is surprisingly quiet. I very nearly struggled to hear him from across the diner. I probably couldn't catch what he said if there wasn't any background noise. Oh yeah, that's me, come on in. He gives a slight bow towards me as he walks in. Go ahead and put it on the counter here. Thanks for bringing the groceries, what's your name? Oh, it's, uh, it's Ada. I'm a farmer on the agricultural deck, he says, placing the crate on the counter. He removes a small potted plant with heart-shaped leaves from the crate. I also brought you an Ivanian mint plant. I thought maybe you might like it. He extends the pot towards me and our fingers brush slightly as I take it from him. I take hold of one of the slightly fuzzy leaves and pluck it off the plant. Nice to meet you, Ada, and thank you. This is edible, right? Ada nods, and I place the leaf on my tongue. It tastes green and slightly cooling. Oh, it's nice. Thank you, this is so kind. It's, it's no trouble at all. I place the little plant on the shelf by my cooking station and then lean over the counter to get a closer look at the contents of the crate. Oh. I look into the crate and realise with embarrassment I don't recognise a single piece of produce. I shouldn't be surprised. This is a multi-species station, home to only a handful of humans. Of course the Ag Deck would be more focused on growing crops catering them to the myriad of other species that call the Hesperides home. I spot a tomato hidden amongst the unfamiliar fruits and veggies. At least I know what to do with that one. Oh, is something wrong? Ada asks, worried eyes moving from the crate to me and back to the crate. Oh, no, no nothing's wrong. It's just, I don't really know what any of these are except for the tomato. I like those. I've never left my home system and we don't really grow many crops from other planets in Helios. Oh yeah, I, that, that makes sense. Sorry, I, I should have just brought you things you'd be familiar with. He avoids my eyes. The poor guy looks so embarrassed. Oh, no, don't be. You didn't do anything wrong. Everything looks really interesting and I'll have to learn to cook with what I can get on the station sooner or later. Ada's, Ada's expression brightens, meeting my eyes once again. If you'd like, maybe we could do a little taste test. You could sample the produce I brought and I could tell you a little bit about each one. Ooh, go on then, taste test. I like that. Should we get out a cutting board? 
No, 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 no need for, that, get, for you to get anything dirty. I'm sure this will be fine. Ada pulls out a small pocket knife from one of his overall pockets. We sit across from each other at the counter and start to go through the box of fruits and vegetables. His voice is still quiet, but his tone is more confident. Which one do I want to try first? Ooh. Oh, I can pick. This one looks like a radish. Let's go with the pink one. I point to the prettiest fruit of the munch. Looks like a blue bubble with a pink centre. What's this one? This is a sea berry from Naru. We actually grow those underwater in our saltwater glow shrimp tanks. The plants and the shrimp provide each other with nutrients that keep each other healthy. It's a fascinating symbiosis. Go and try one. Just take the little top part off before you do. I turn the small crystal-like fruit over in my hand. The outer membrane shines with bubble-like rainbow iridescence. It's almost too pretty to eat. Almost. I take off the top part as Ada instructed and pop the sea berry into my mouth. The moment my teeth break the outer membrane, I'm met with a gush of salty, slightly sweet water. Ooh. Followed by the sweet, tropical, and slightly floral taste of the inner fruit. Oh, that's so unique. Oh, okay, next one. Let's go with the radish. This one kind of looks like a radish. <laughs> I say, handing Ada the big white root vegetable. It's a snow root. They grow in meltwater ponds and run on near hot springs but we just grow them in special hydroponic towers here. Ada slices into the snow root with his knife. I'm surprised to see that there are lace-like holes running through the centre of the root. He hands me a slice and I take a bite. It's crunchy and starchy like a potato, but there's a slight zesty, spicy radish taste. Ooh, it's nice, I like the crunch. Ada nods in agreement. There's a lot you can do with them. Cook them, bake them, mash them, and eat them raw. They're incredibly filling as well. Okay, next. This one, the little octopus squid one. This looks like a hand with too many fingers. I say, pointing to the red-orange fruit. Yeah, the Sketro chilies are freaky looking, but they're delicious. How are you with spice? Ooh, I'm bad. I'm pretty bad. I'm pretty weak when it comes to spicy food. It's not that spicy, so you should be fine. The peppers from your home system have a chemical called capsicum in them that makes them spicy. This one's got a little bit of that too. But they also can try in a hydroxy alpha sensual, which has more of a tingly effect. Okay, let's do it. I want to try. I'm going to give it a go. Ada breaks off a finger from the chili and hands it to me. I go for it, taking a bite. It's crunchy and very similar to the peppers I've had before. The heat is subtle, creeping up before the tingling hits, numbing my tongue slightly. It's tasty and the numbing spice is kind of addictive. How is it? Not too spicy? I shake my head. No, no, it's not too spicy at all. It's actually pretty tasty. Okay, good. Okay, we'll go green one. How about this flower ball? Ah, atlas beads. These are a staple in the Aurelian system. We have these in some form or another a couple times a day. You can make sweet or savoury dishes with them, and they're great protein source. This is beans? It's a pot. He picks up the sphere and shakes it next to my head. The slightest rattle comes from inside. Here, let me show you. He peels back a part of the membrane and shakes five large indigo beans out of the pod and into his palm, which he then extends towards me. You can try them raw and fresh from the pot like this, but it's more traditional to cook them. This flower here is edible too, though it's uh, more used as a garnish to make a dish pretty than as something you'd actually want to eat. I pass on the flower, but go ahead and try one of the beans. It tastes pretty much like a bean. Like any other bean I've had. <laughs> a bit starchy. Yeah, I think I can see why. I bet if I cook them, they'd taste much better. Okay, purple one. How about this one? I lift up a purple and yellow vine bearing bright purple fruits. Cashew berries from Ranon. The ultimate superfood. These are incredibly important food source for the K tree, and they're also incredible crops to grow on ag decks. On top of being full of antioxidants, they're one of the best sources of vitamin D you can get. Oh, that's nice to have when you're nowhere near a sun, I say, pulling a berry off its vine and popping it into my mouth. 
Once I bite through the firm skin of the fruit, I'm left with a soft, 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 chewy texture. There is an initial tartness that disappears quickly and is followed by a deep berry sweetness. Like a combination of a blackberry and a purple grape. Okay, last but not least, the red one. Let's go for it. I point to the pinkish red pear-shaped fruit with a crown of spikes on its larger end. This is a ruby fruit uh, from Sketro, he explains, picking the fruit up and slicing into it. These used to be near impossible to grow on ships. They're a cactus fruit with very specific requirements. But about five standard rotations ago, the Sketrians came up with a gene-modded version that can be farmed on standard grow towers with some minor adjustments. Higher yielding too. Ada cuts himself off, as if remembering something. Oh, sorry, I hope I'm not boring you too much, he says sheepishly with an apologetic look. The peel is edible, but it's not very tasty here. He hands me a peeled slice. Fruit is juicy, slightly crunchy and full of seeds. Ooh, it's very sweet. Something about the flavour reminds me of bubblegum. Which one did you like best? Ooh, which one did I? I might go sea berry, the first one I had. Oh, the beans were quite good. These Not beans, the Keshri berry. Let's go sea one, the bubble one. Definitely the sea berry. So unique and I love the mix of sweet and salty. They're fun to eat. I could eat a whole crate of them. I'm glad you were able to find something you liked. Ada says with a smile. I think I want to try cooking something. It's about lunchtime. Have you eaten yet? Oh, no, but it's fine. Um, You don't need to worry about me. I'm, I'm not really hungry right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Ada quickly rises from his seat at the counter. He turns to such a leaf, but as if betraying him, Ada's stomach growls loudly. His face darkens in embarrassment. That settles it. I'm making us lunch. It's the least I can do after you brought me all this stuff. Sit down and relax, please. <laughs> I tell him and he sheepishly returns to his spot and sits down. Thank you, Evie. Sorry. Sorry for all the trouble. Don't. It's no trouble at all. Let's see lunch. What? to make. I think soup sounds nice and easy. How about... Oh, something from my home, something from Ada's home, or Milky Way Diner Speciality. Should I do something for him? Something that he'd like? Although I don't know how to cook anything yet. Maybe he'll tell me. Let's try. Something from your home, Ada. What do you think? Do we have ingredients to make Arulian soup? We do, but... Are you sure you wouldn't rather cook something from your home world instead? Oh, maybe I should have picked that. No, nonsense. I'm making you lunch to thank you. I want to make it something you'd like. Besides, I need to learn new recipes if I'm going to cater to everyone here. Can't just make human recipes all the time. Only if you're sure. How about Atlas bean soup? It's pretty simple. And it's a staple on the Aurelian moons. Ooh, I like the sound of that. What's in it? There are two different versions. My family is from... Avania, where the more traditional sweet version is popular. But on Leonia and Arulia Prime, they adopted Sketro chilies and a spicy version of the dish is more liked. In that case, I'll make... His family like the sweet one. Let's do the sweet one. Sweet Atlas bean soup. What do we need? Just Atlas beans, sweetener, and salt. No water? <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very solid soup. I'll try my best. I hope I don't mess up too badly. Oh, <gasps> this is fun. I've got a little kitchen. Okay, pot. Oh, we need beans. This one, sorry. <laughs> and then, can we add random things? Oh, pantry. Sweetener. Salt. What are these? Milk, flour, agar. Cook. Oh, okay. Comforting, slightly sweet and hearty Arulian peasant dish. Oh, no. It looks yummy. It doesn't look like it would be for peasants at all. It looks beautiful. Serve it up. I think that'll do. I say, looking over my shoulder from my station. All the while that I've been cooking, Ada has been watching me. One elbow propped on the counter, his hand supporting his head. Of course, every time I look over at him, he made a point to look literally anywhere else. Eventually, I just decided to pretend I didn't notice and focus on cooking. Serve him a bowl of feed. Oh, I'm sorry, um, but you're feeding yourself. I'm not going to spoon feed you. The aeroplane is not flying in today. <laughs> I grab two green bowls and ladle soup into them till they're both full. Place one bowl in front of Ada on the counter. 
Then I take my bowl, deciding to eat on the cook side, standing and facing him. Dig in, I hope I managed to get the recipe right. Let me know if I need to do anything different next time. Ada digs in with enthusiasm, his eyes widen as he takes the first bite. Oh, it's fantastic, Evie. Are you sure this is your first time making a Runian food? You cook the beans perfectly, the texture is spot on. You even garnish with a bit of the Avarian mint. What can I say? I'm just, I'm a beast. The mint was just a lucky S on my part. Don't you think you're flattering me too much? It's like you said, it's a pretty simple dish. I ask with a laugh. I'm glad I managed to succeed in making an Aurelian dish. I don't think so. If anything, I don't think I can praise you enough. Ada sighs. Eating this makes me feel like I'm back home. Well, then I'm glad. This is seriously delicious. Have you always been a chef? Since birth! Oh, okay, no. <laughs> I've never worked as one professionally, if that's what you're asking. But I've always liked cooking. It made me happy to see my family and friends enjoy the meals I made them. Seeing you enjoy this meal now, I feel like I made the right choice coming here. You know, your aunt told me that once. She saw it as an honour to get to cook for people. That it made her glad to know that no matter how bad of a day someone was having, once they came into the Milky Way diner, they'd at least leave with a full belly and a better mood. I feel a similar way about the work I do on the Ag Deck. I noticed you get pretty passionate when you talk about plants and things. I've always loved growing things. It's kind of like that happiness you said you get when you see people enjoy the food you cook. It makes me happy knowing the plants I take care of will go on to feed my community. There's so much warmth in his coral eyes, I can tell Ada means every single word he says. You're a really kind person, Ada. And so are you he says with a soft, kind smile. Together we finish our food, chatting a little here and there, but mostly just enjoying the meal in each other's company. That was delicious. Thank you for lunch, Evie. Let me help you with the dishes. He grabs his bowl and gets up from his seat. Ada extends his hand towards my empty bowl, but I snatch it out of the way. He gives me a puzzled look. You're welcome, but do you normally ask to help with the dishes when you eat out? I ask jokingly. Ada lets out a little laugh of amusement. No, no, but I'm not exactly a paying customer right now, am I? So let me give you a hand. He reaches for the bowl again, and this time I let him take it. He walks behind the counter and heads to the sink. I made this meal to thank you. Now I can't help but feel like I owe you again. Oh, wash with him, or ask if he wants put. Hmm. I can, oh, we'll do them together. I join Ada at the sink, drying dishes as he finishes washing them and putting everything back in its place. Together, cleanup goes quickly. I wipe down the counters quickly, and the diner is just as I found it once again. Thank you for helping me clean up, Ada, and for bringing those ingredients too. Oh, anytime, Evie, and thank you for lunch. I have to head back to the Ag Deck now. What are you going to do with the rest of your day? I think I'm going to head to my room and take a rest. I've, it's been a long day already and the afternoon's barely started. Together we walk out of the Milky Way diner and I turn off the lights as I leave. We stand outside the diner on the promenade. Sounds like a good plan. You should take it easy. I'll see you soon. Let me give you my contact information. I used to drop off produce weekly for Cassie. I'll do the same for you. I can't guarantee I'll have the same stuff every week though. I hand him my palm pad and he swiftly enters his details. He then hands the device back to me. That sounds great, thank you. I hope you have a good rest of your day. You too. We smile and wave at each other as we go our separate ways. As I draw closer to block three, I hear voices coming down the hall. No, dang it. Not again. There's gotta be a way out of this. I told you. You've got to keep your eye on your opponent's rook. I'm round the bend and taking my surroundings. There's a large common area with a sunken conversation pit where two people, a human with red hair and a sketrian are playing hollow chess. There's an opening in the right wall leading to a common kitchen and three doors which I assume lead to the residents' apartments. This human game is far too simple. 
and I believe with this move, the Sketian moves the aforementioned rook and captures the human's king. I win, and your credits are mine. The red-haired human looks crushed. Oh, come on, Zenith. Best two out of three. That's not what we agreed upon. Besides, I've got work to... The Sketrian Seteth looks up from the board and his eyes fix on me. The human follows his gaze. There's landing on me and their face instantly breaks out into a smile. Hi. I give a small wave. Hi there. Hi there, you must be the new neighbour. She would message me saying you would be on your way soon. I'm Roswell. Nice to meet you. They climb out of the conversation pit and hold out their gloved hand. Roswell's grip is firm and their handshake as well. Enthusiastic. I'm Evius. Nice to meet you too. I'm the new neighbour, I guess. I'm taking over the Milky Way diner. Sorry for interrupting. It seems like you two were in the middle of a pretty heated battle. Hardly. I had just finished claiming victory. Sedith turns off the hollow deck and climbs out of the conversation pit as well, standing beside Roswell. I am Sedith Sesketerat, researcher. Roswell elbows him in the side. Now do the thing, like we practiced. They say out of the corner of their mouth. Sedith rolls his yellow eyes and extends a three-fingered scaly hand, offering it for a handshake. I take his hand in mine, it feels odd. A bit cold and a far different shape than I'm used to, but altogether a well-executed gesture. After, after Seteth lets go, Roswell gives him a friendly pat on the back. There you go, bud. You killed it. Roswell leans in towards me and mock whispers. Seteth was super nervous about making a good first impression on our new neighbour. He even asked for a refresher on human greeting customs. I did not. Seteth sputters, embarrassed, his tail swishing back and forth in agitation. Ooh. Reworth it. You did a good job. What's your greeting? Okay, what's yours? What's the Sketrian greeting custom? I'm grateful you made the effort. And well, my voice trails off. I really should have brushed up on my interspecies relations before coming all the way out here. Seteth clears his throat and shifts awkwardly. That's, uh, um, well, the thing is... Uh, how should I put this? Roswell leans in towards me and whispers under her breath. Grisketrian greetings are kind of, um, intimate. By mammal standards, yes. It's hardly my fault you're all so weird about your chests. I'm sorry, chests? Seshith pinches the bridge of his nose and sighs. Allow me to demonstrate. Roswell suddenly looks very interested in their palm pad averting their eyes and absently scrolling through messages. Seteth turns to the empty space on his side and folds his left arm behind his back. Oops. <laughs> First, I would make a fist over my heart with my right hand like so. Then reach out and place my palm over your heart. Seteth mimes the motion into empty space, keeping his palm in position for about three seconds. His movements are gentle and undeniably graceful. He then puts down his arm and turns back to face me. You would then reciprocate the same gesture. In essence, it is an expression of trust, a way to prove that you are no threat. Having another's claw right above your heart is a risky position to put oneself in, after all. I glance down at Seteth's hands, three massive, thick, yellow claws at the end on strong, scaly digits. There is also a gesture as an alternative. He puts down his middle finger and makes an arching gesture from his forehead outward. As a non sketrian this will suffice. We understand that other species don't have the same boundaries as we do. Though if I were to introduce myself to another member of my own species this way, it would come off as cold at best and hostile at worst. Oh, I see. In that case... Ah, oh, let's go traditional, why not? I step in front of Seteth. I'm a bit nervous, but there's no going back now. I steady myself and just go for it. I mimic Seteth's actions from before, folding my left arm behind my back and making a fist with my right over my heart. I then reach out and gently place my hand over Seteth's heart. Time slows down for a bit at that moment. 
Even through his clothes, I can feel that his body is colder than a human's. I can feel his heart. Set his heart beating hard and fast under my hand, his chest rising and falling under my palm. I look towards his face and a small smile is playing on his lips. I feel heat rise in my face and I realise a second too long has passed. I remove my hand as quickly as if I've burned it by a stove. Seteth notices he didn't say anything. It's good to meet you, Evie, Seteth says with a warm tone. Left hand behind his back, he makes a fist with his right hand, places it over his heart, and then reaches out and places his palm over my chest where my heart lays. His large, cold, claw hand is still and unmoving on my chest, feeling my heart beat. I understand why this is an expression of trust for his species. He could rip the heart out of my chest if he wanted to. Literally. It's good to meet you too, Seteth. After the three longest minutes of my life, Seteth removes his hand from my chest. As if on cue, Roswell puts their palm pad back in their pocket. See what I mean? I intimate. Seteth clears his throat. Anyway, welcome to block three. Yeah, welcome. How was your flight? Did it go okay? It's a long way from the Helios system. Are you from the Helios system too? No, I was born on the Casper. That's one of the three original human extrasolar mobile space settlements, right? The three Magi, as they're called, are three massive ships that left the Helios system not long after the first contact with the Galactic Embassy almost two centuries ago. I remember the first time I took a long-haul transport off the Casper. It was budget, of course, and I felt like I had the worst hangover for days after being in the pod. The same thing happened when I travelled to the Hesperides. I went to the Milky Way diner, feeling like literal death, and Cassie made the most amazing soup. And poof, I think I have a feeling gone. I swear, it was like... Roswell stops mid-sentence, seemingly remembering that in that moment that Aunt Cassie is gone. They shake their head and blink back the tears that started to form in their eyes. Your aunt... She was a really great lady. The Milky Way Diner means a lot to all of us here. It's really great that you're carrying on that legacy and keeping it open. Seteth nods his head solemnly. She really was something. I ate pretty much all my meals there. We both did. Nothing beats Cass's spicy... (laughs) Fried spiny bugs, huh? Roswell sighs wistfully and Seteth rolls his eyes again. Cass's cooking was indeed very good, but that dish is simply a waste of perfectly good spiny bugs. No, it's not. Fried spiny bugs are literally my second favourite food of all time. What is it you humans like to say? You could deep fry circuits and they would taste good. All you're tasting is oil, salt and starch. You can hardly taste the delicate flavour of the meat under all that batter. I personally prefer them simmered. I like to actually enjoy my bugs for what they are. Um, I'm sorry, spiny bugs. The name sounds vaguely familiar, but... As for what they look like and taste like, I'm drawing a blank. You really haven't left the Helios system, have you? They're huge out here in GA space and in the colonies. Super tasty. Much more substantial than the crickets you get in the Helios system. You'll love them. Cassie once said they taste kind of like lobster, which I've never had, but I think it's supposed to be good. They're a specialty from my home planet. Ada breeds them on the agricultural deck. You can ask him to bring you a couple to sample. Oh, well, that's good to know. I'm actually kind of curious. I bet they taste great fried or simmered. I've got to go fried. I'm a human after all now. I bet they taste great fried and spicy. With something to dip them in. Oh, a chipotle mayo. <laughs> now you're talking. You've got to make us some sometime. I'll do my best, though I can't guarantee there is... I'll do my best, though I can't guarantee the result will be good as... 
I'll do my best, though I can't guarantee the result will be as good as Aunt Cassie's. I'm sure they'll turn out great. Certainly better than anything I could make. That's not saying much. Roswell is an absolutely abysmal cook. <sighs> Oof, harsh. And the truth, sadly. I can fix any piece of tech you put in front of me, but I have no idea how to put together a decent meal. I've been living off of instant food since the diner closed. You'll be seeing a lot of me after you open up shop. Roswell snaps their fingers as if something just came to them. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. I have a welcome present for you. Ooh, a present? Yeah, just a little welcome to the neighbourhood gift. Roswell leans down and grabs the small duffel bag that was sitting on the couch. They dig around for a moment before pulling out a lumpy ball wrapped in festively patterned reusable cloth and hand it to me. Oh, thank you. Should I open it now or should I do it later in my room? Definitely now. I want to see the look on your face. Yes, I am too rather curious to see how you will respond. Between Seth's amusement and Roswell's naked enthusiasm, I feel a little bit nervous. Is this going to be a prank of some kind? These two don't seem like the type to haze their new neighbour. Tentatively, I open the wrapping to reveal a fuzzy blue ball with big ears. <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> he looks like a Furby. It's a robotic yellow eyes. Click open and I flinch, almost dropping the contraption. Oh, look at his little paws. Oh my god. Whoa, easy there. I steady myself and take another look at it. Some kind of pet bot. The kind that's pretty popular with kids, but it's not any creature I recognise. Do you like it? I know it can be hard adjusting to a new place. I found this little cutie in a box of cage scraps Kale brought back from Ran and I fixed them up to keep you company. They're supposed to be a rune, well, a cartoonish interpretation of one. Kale said they were super popular on our homeworld when she was a cub. Don't hold back. I told Roswell it was a bit of a juvenile idea. That's just another word for fun. I'll be honest. The little robot starts to let out a slight, rumbling, mechanical purr. There's no denying the sound is comforting in its own way. Oh, I love it. It's cute. I love it. It's really cute. A bit creepy. It's not creepy, but cute. Creepy cute. Exactly. Set its shudders. It stares into your soul. Right into your soul. That's part of the room's charm. Kael told me in the wilds of Ranon, they immobilise their prey with their stare. Oh, thanks so much, Roswell. This was so thoughtful of you. I really do love it. Roswell blushes, beaming with happiness. Their smile bright and as warm as sunshine. I feel myself start to blush a little too. I had a feeling you'd be a fan. I'm more than a fan. This little cutie and me are going to be best mates. Hearing that, the little pet bot rune starts purring even more. What does it do? Well, it's got basic AI. It'll respond if you pet it or pick it up or talk to it. It can give off a little heat too. You can also ask it for the weather. What weather? We live on a space station. Oh, okay, fine. It'll tell you the weather if you take it planet side. All the news. They make pointed they make a pointed glance at Seteth. Which is relevant everywhere. It's even got a built-in speaker function, so it can play your music. All of which the AI assistant built into your living quarters can do. Yeah, but you can't cuddle the living quarters AI. No you can't. Score one for the rune. If you ever need any maintenance on it, or anything else, give me a shout. I'm the head of tech on the Hesperides. If it's broken, Oh, I can fix it. Just then, an alarm on Roswell's palm pad sounds. Speaking of which, duty calls. I better get back to the tech office. And I should head back to the lab. It was good to meet you, Evie. You guys too. Oh, I have an idea. Why don't we all head to Wayfarer's Rest for drinks tonight? A little welcome party for our new friend. What do you say? We'll meet you after we're done working for the day. I'll try my best to make it. I've got this experiment. It can wait. Come on, Seth, live a little. I live plenty.
That sounds fun, yeah. I guess I'll see you guys later. I'm gonna drop my stuff off in my room and get settled for a little bit. But yeah, rest up, rest up, take care, we'll see you later. Sedith gives me a friendly wave before turning around and walking out of the block with Roswell following behind. Now, I believe you have credits to transfer me. Oh, I was hoping you'd forgot. I walk over to the door for room three and I scan my wrist chip. The door slides open and I take my first steps into my new room, carrying the rune in my arms as it continues to purr away, oh, like a little baby. My bags were left in the sunken entry alcove, placed carefully by the delivery bot from earlier, I presume. I remove my shoes and take a look around the room. It's cosier than I expected it to be. There's a bathroom and a little kitchenette, as she would describe. There's also a sleeping nook with plush looking sheets, they do look good sheets, and a warm golden glow coming from lights in the walls of the nook. Finally, there's also a surprisingly large window looking out into space. I can see the distant blinking sights of one of those stable wormhole entrances, and the occasional flashes of a starship sipping by. It's peaceful. I place the little rune pet bot on the shelf by my bed. Its little robot eyes blink a couple times, looking around the room. <laughs> He's so funny. It's like a woo! A little voice calls from inside the pet bot. The speakers crackle a little with age. Huh? I take a seat on the bed and lean until I'm eye level with the rune. Vasha Ross Vasha Nuka! The little robot creature's ears move up and down as it looks at me. Are you speaking Kaitri? Sagva! I don't speak Kaitri, I'm sorry. Kash, Kaesh, Vesh, Ra! The rune closes its eyes for a few moments and rumbles a little. When the rumbling stops, it opens them again. Language path updated to Galactic Assembly Standard Dialect. Hello, friend! What's your name? Oh, it's Evie. Hello, Evie! Is there a name you would like me to respond to? Oh my god, oh, what should we call him? Oh, Stephen? No. Craig. <laughs> I think Craig is fun. I want to call you Craig. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll go by Craig from now on. Do you want to play? Oh, maybe some other time, little guy. I kind of want to take a nap right now. I say, peeling off my travelling clothes and flopping onto the bed. Somehow it's even comfier than it looked. I crawl under the covers and let out a contented sigh. Lights off. I call out and the lights of the room switch off. I turn over in bed and look into the, into the rune's glowing eyes. Can you wake me up in a couple hours? Of course, my friend Evie. Sweet dreams. Night night. I close my eyes and almost fall immediately asleep. When I wake up from my nap, it's about an hour and a half before I'm supposed to meet Roswell and set it at Wayfarer's Rest. I unpack my bags, take a refreshing water shower, and get dressed. I figure it won't hurt to be a little bit early, so I decided to head to Wayfarer's Rest and have a drink while I wait. Ooh. I walk into the Wayfarer's Rest. It's a dim space sparsely lit with Neil. There are a handful of patrons scattered around occupying tables and stools along the bar. I decided to grab myself a spot at the counter. I look over one of the small drink menus on the bar, and as expected, none of the cocktails are anything I'm familiar with. Oh, the person behind the bar, a Kaitri with long hair, wearing incredibly fine clothes, walks over to where I sit, faces a glass of water in front of me on a purple, on a purple cloth napkin, and gives me an easy smile. Welcome to the Wayfarer's Rest, dear guest. I'm Laro. Is there anything I can get you started with? Or would you like a bit more time with the menu? I look over the unfamiliar list of alien drinks with alien ingredients. I recognise a few of them now, thanks to Ada, but it's not enough to really know what I want. Uh, what would you recommend? Depends on what you like. I'm sure I can make you something that will be to your taste. Ooh, in that case, let's go something sweet. I'd like something sweet. Then I have just the thing. 
Laro busies himself taking bottles of liquor off the shelf behind him and mixing the ingredients together with practiced efficiency. Ooh, <gasps> that's pretty. That's very cute. I made a good choice. Once he's finished, he places a glass before me, filled with a deep purple liquid. There are two small blossoms floating on top, along with what I guess are three skewered keshri berries. Here you go. This is called Sumokta. It means spring twilight, and it's a classic Keitri drink. I take a sip and the drink tastes sweet as candy. There is an unmistakable flavour of Keshri berries with a floral note, and a wine-like tannic taste at the end. Oh, it's delicious. What's in it? A bit of Keshri set, some Takmo, and a little Keshri blossom syrup. So, what brings you to the Hesperides, dear guest? And would you honour me by sharing your name? Laro asks, his voice as smooth as velvet. Um, I'm Evie, I just moved here today to take over management of um, the Milky Way Diner. Laro's eyes narrow slightly at my response. Oh, so that's why you asked. He says, still smiling, but there's a coldness to his tone that wasn't there before. You're here to steal my recipes. Scope out the competition? Maybe you're looking to add a cocktail menu to the Milky Way Diner, hmm? Kayle told me about the new chef when she dropped off to, when she dropped off my delivery today. He makes a point of looking me up and down, sizing me up with his cat-like gaze. She said you were cute for a human, but I don't quite know if I see it. He leans casually on the counter behind him, arms folded, his eyes locked on mine. Oh. That's exactly why I'm here. Are we really competition? Are we really competition? Get over yourself. I'm going to go for it. Or maybe, and this is crazy, I'm just here to enjoy a drink while I wait for my friends. Besides, are we really in competition? I ask matter-of-factly and unamused. You run a bar, I run a diner. They're pretty different niches. We don't have anything to worry about. Are you and my aunt competitors or something? Is that why you suddenly got all cagey the second you learned who I am? I ask, taking another sip of my drink, which is annoyingly good. We were friendly rivals, he says with a grin as he busies himself with cleaning glassware. I guess there would be a bit of competition for customers who are just passing through. Ooh. I guess we'll just have to see who comes out on top. I guess we'll just have to see who comes out on top, won't we? I smirk, taking another sip of my drink. Lara regards me with an amused expression. Though, I guess I won't be able to get a drink as good as this on the station if I run you out of business. I admire your confidence. I might just have to stop by the Milky Way Diner and see just how good your cooking is. Decide for myself if I have to worry about you running me out of business, as you say. As long as you don't steal my recipes while you're at it. Arrow lets out a purring chuckle. I don't quite think I need to resort to that. Friendly rivals, then? I ask, raising my glass. Friendly rivals, Laro says as he sets about prepping what looks to be garnishes for cocktails. As I continue to sip my drink, my eyes wander to the shelves of unfamiliar bottles. So what's in all of these? I ask, pointing to the shelves behind Laro. Probably drinks, no? <laughs> It's not all alcohol, right? Not at all, Laro answers. Arulians cannot consume alcohol, nor can the Naru, but they have their own beverages that produce altered states. There's dreamflower nectar from the Arulian system. Laro turns around and pulls down a round bottle filled with a thick golden yellow substance, placing it on the counter for me to examine. It has a lovely sweet flavour and a mild psychedelic effect I find rather enjoyable myself. Can humans drink it? Yes, the narrow can as well. Sadly, Sketrians are a bit sensitive to some of the compounds found within, so they generally don't consume it. Not unless they're looking to have a very wild night. Okay, <laughs> I say, picking up the bottle and turning it over in my hand, watching the golden sparkling liquid swirl around inside. And this is Quilum, the narrow's drink of choice. Naro explains, pulling another bottle down from the shelf, 
This one is tall and skinny and filled with a mysterious iridescent looking liquid. It's made from puff puff fish venom. Sadly, Kaitri can't enjoy this, but it's safe for you humans. I've been told it induces a lovely mellow high. I guess it makes sense that not every species can consume the same thing safely. Laro nods thoughtfully. It is indeed a very important thing to consider when you're providing food to multiple species. Oh, I've got a lot to learn if I don't want to end up accidentally poisoning anyone. That would be bad for your business, he muses before adding with a devilish smile, but potentially good for mine. I hear the bar door behind me chime and a familiar friendly voice calls out. Hey, Evie, you made it. It's Roswell. I turn around to see Roswell with Vega in tow. Oh, you don't mind that I invited Vega along. She mentioned you guys had met. Vega gives me a friendly little wave. Oh no, it's not at all. It's nice to see you again. Roswell looks behind me and waves at the bartender. Hey, Lara. Welcome, dear guests. Please take a seat wherever you like. Roswell and Vega walk over and join me at the bar. Laro, can I get a bottle of Keshaw, please? Laro nods pleasantly, taking a purple glass bottle out from under the counter and popping off the cap before handing it to Roswell. What's that? Is it any good? It's kind of like a beer, so I like it. They take a drink from the bottle. I've been looking forward to this all day. Why don't you carry any human drinks? Can I try a sip? Oh. Come on, let me have a sip. Why not? Can I have a sip? Roswell flushes, tapping the side of the bottle with the tips of their fingers. Isn't that like an indirect kiss? Oh my god. I can't help but laugh. Are you not a bit old to think like that? It's fine if you don't want to share. I don't mind. I would have just skied it, you know? No, it's cool. Here, here. I'm Jill. <laughs> Roswell hands me the bottle of Keshok, blushing slightly and avoiding my eyes. I thank them and take a sip. It tastes a bit more like a dry, citrusy cider than a beer, but it's nice. Oh, it's good. Thanks for letting me try, I say, smiling at Roswell as I hand them back the bottle. They immediately proceed to down half the contents in one chug. Oh, I'll have one of those as well, please. Laro raises an eyebrow at Vega. I'm sorry, miss, but I'm afraid I cannot serve you Keshok. It's alcoholic. Oh, right, silly me. Vega laughs awkwardly. It's her first time out of her home system too, I explain to Laro. How about a dream flower reshet fizz instead? He asks, turning to Vega. Oh, sure, that's that would work as well. Laro turns around and he busies himself with preparing Vega's drink. What's the status of your ship? I turn to Vega and ask. Respectfully, it's not a ship, it's a fossil. Hey! No offence. Roswell raises their hands. It's an Aurelian Greta. That class of ship hasn't been in production for like 75 years. I'm impressed that it's even still operational. I doubt it would even pick up on most modern scanners. Vega's lucky the sensors we have on the station are also fossils. The rescue team might not have reached her in time otherwise. I told Vega that I could fix it, but it's going to take me a while to find the compatible parts I'm missing. I said she's better off just cutting her losses and flying commercial, but she said, I said I would rather just wait. Vega says, cutting Roswell off. It's not like I'm in a hurry. Besides, the station seems nice. Here's your reshet fizz, Miss Vega. Larry says, placing the drink and napkin in front of Vega with a smile. Thank you. Laro, right? Correct. A pleasure. The door chime goes off again. Over here, Ada. Zedith. Roswell calls, waving the bo them both over to the bar. They turn to me apologetically. Okay, so maybe I didn't just also invite Vega. I thought a welcome party would be fun. The others should be here too soon. Others? Yeah, she was sorry, a KL. You met them all, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah I've met them all. Great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> Roswell turns to Seth and Ada. Hey, guys. This is Ada. They motion towards Vega with a flourish. She's also new to the station. The starship exploded. She's very lucky not to be dead. Vega bows towards Ada. 
She then greets Seteth with an arching gesture from her forehead outward with her right hand. It's a pleasure to meet you both. Nice to meet you too, Vega. Nice, nice to meet you. Ada says with a polite bow. I can tell he's making an effort to speak louder so he can be understood over the music and conversations. He tilts his head slightly as he looks at Vega. I'm sorry to ask, but have we met before? Vega shifts a little at Ada's question. Um, no. Why? Oh, of course. Sorry I asked. You look so familiar. Just can't quite remember how. She's like the princess or something. For sure. <laughs> I guess I just have one of those faces. Vega says with an uncomfortable laugh, turning to continue to talking to Roswell. Anything I can get you boys? I'll have a seckish neat, please. And um, I'll have a nectar spritz, please. Coming right up. Larry turns and gets to work on their drinks. Did you guys both have a good rest of your day? I ask Lettith and Ada. It was productive. I was wondering, what exactly is your research out here? I'm a deep space biophysicist. My area of study involves a particular near-microscopic species that lives in the vacuum of space, called Tarsex. They're particularly drawn to areas where the fabric of space and time is a bit looser. So the nexus point of four stable wormholes is an ideal place to collect samples and study them. How does a species even survive in the vacuum of space? The answer to that question is a bit complicated for this setting. But perhaps you could come by my lab someday, and I would explain my research a bit more thoroughly. Ooh, that would be really cool. I'd be happy to take you up on that. I turn to Ada. Did you have a good rest of your day too, Ada? He nods. We transferred some strawberry seedlings to the grow towers. <gasps> strawberries? You grow strawberries here too. When will they be ready? In about two weeks, I'll include some in your produce delivery once they're ready. Ooh, I'm looking forward to it. I'd love some as well, Laro says, handing Ada and Seteth their drinks. I have a great idea for a new cocktail. Alright, let's get this party started! <laughs> was a familiar voice from the entrance of the bar. I look over to see KL stride into the Wayfarer's Rest. Laro, Seketh, Vo, Tecmo Voshra. Sa, Varushma. Larry responds in Kaitri and pours Kael a shot of clear alcohol. She takes the shot from Laro, slams it back in one swift motion. Whoa! Now that's what I'm talking about. She explains and then turns to Roswell. Hey, Sparky! Roswell and Kael share a high five that becomes a surprisingly elaborate secret handshake. She then turns to Ada, giving him a friendly pat on the back. Sprout, my man! How are those seeds? I brought you back last time. They're doing great. They just started germinating. Love to hear it. Seteth, always fun seeing you out of your science cave. The word you're looking for is laboratory. Yeah, but science cave is just a more fun way to say it. And you, Kale says, turning to me with a bright smile. How was your day, sugar? I hear Seteth mutter. You really couldn't wait until Amy got settled before trying to charm her, hmm? Kale shoots him an icy glare before turning back to me. It was pretty good, I'd say. You know, lots of new friends. I have to ask, are you gonna keep calling me that from now on? Not unless you ask me to stop. I don't mind. Vega taps twice on Kale's shoulder to get her attention. Hello, we haven't met yet. I'm Vega. Oh, hi. Sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you there. I'm... As KL and Vega introduce themselves to one another, my attention shifts to the other people entering the Wayfarer's Rest, Shiwu and Saria. They walk over and join us at the bar. Ah, uh, yes. Doctor and officer. Anything I can get for you, my dear guests? I'll take a glass of Quilum. Just some iced tea with mineral water, please. Coming right up. Laro says with an easy smile. How are you feeling? Oh, much better. Thank you for asking. Of course. 
We'll try not to keep you out so late. You need your rest to adjust to GA standard time. Days are a bit longer than you're probably used to. Speaking of rest, she turns to Shiwu. Are you getting enough rest, Shiwu? The meds you gave me are doing their job to help me fall asleep. But I still find myself waking up multiple times a night. I see. Come by my office tomorrow and we'll talk more. Maybe I could make you something that could help. Laro offers, placing Shiwu and Sar- Saraya's drink on the counter in front of them. I'll remind you that I'm two years sober, Shiwu says with an exasperated sigh. Something non-alcoholic. Honestly, I'm hurt you'd think I'd disrespect your sobriety like that. Though if you need someone to come over to your room and read you a bedtime story... Laro winks at Shiwu suggestively. But he completely ignores Lauro. Totally unfazed by his comment, Shiwu takes a sip of his iced tea. Honestly, why does everyone on this station care about how much sleep I get? (laughs) Because you have friends who care about you. Because you have friends who care about you. Evie is right. We all just want to see you happy and healthy. Me especially. As your friend and as your physician. I know I'm just not the biggest fan of being fretted over so much. I can take care of myself. Still, I appreciate it. But I'll I'll come by the med bay on my break tomorrow. Can I come see you too tomorrow, Soraya? Oh, I'm a bit keen. Oh, of course you can, Evie. But didn't you just say you were feeling much better? Oh, um, I am, but... I might have trouble adjusting to the time change, like you said, and I uh, wouldn't mind getting the chance to see you. We'll have plenty of time to talk tonight, or she just pied me off. I'll be happy to give you a quick check-up tomorrow, should any problems arise. If you'd like to make a social call, I'd appreciate it if we met outside office hours. I need to give my patients my full attention while I'm working. I hope you understand. That's wild for me to request that. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm sorry if I overstepped. I did. No, not at all. I'm, I'm flattered you wanted to get to know me better. Soraya says, the tips of her hair turning a soft magenta. As conversation continues, Roswell climbs onto the bar. They stand on the counter and call out to the assembled group. All right, get out of your attention. Now that everyone's here, please get off my bar. Right, right, sorry. Roswell hops off the bar and back onto their seat. As I was saying, let's make a toast. Oh my god, the whole squad. Here's everybody. (laughs) To new friends and the grand reopening of the Milky Way Diner. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my gosh, is that it? That's it. Oh, that was very cute. I'm very intrigued. There were obviously, there are a few spelling mistakes in there. But other than that, I mean, it's it's just the demo because they're doing the Kickstarter. So I'm sure all of that will be fixed. But it was really good. It was really cute. The art is so lovely. It looks really nice. Loved it. Thank you guys for joining me on this little adventure. Um, and I'll see you next time. Bye.